as higher than our flesh. This is super important. Mm -hmm. We have to see ourselves as higher than our flesh, as more advanced than our flesh, as being as being here before this flesh and surviving after it, because that is the real truth. That is the reality. Next slide. All right. You remember this movie? Did you have you seen the, the remakes, brother? I didn't Abdul? see the remake. No, I, I heard about it. I haven't seen the remakes. No, absolutely incredible. Absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. You see, you 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 see the pictures of the of 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 the 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 cast on the right of the slide, right? Yeah, yeah. Look for, look familiar. Oh yeah. To something that we're watching on Netflix now. Yeah. The um. Yeah. The um. Supercell. Supercell. With the eyes. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Supercell. Right. Okay. In the Dune series. Those people with the eyes that, that are blue like this are because they are exposed to a particular exotic substance that only exists on their planet. Only exists on their planet. And in the, mo in the movie series, it's called Spice. And this spice, they say, is the most valuable substance in the universe. It does two major things. Spice folds space. And spice expands consciousness. <laughs> this is crazy, okay? And so, in the in the, the movie series, has a ton of North African Islamic messianic themes. North African Islamic messianic themes. One, there's a challenge to imperialism. We, we, you're watching CNN today. You're watching whatever Fox News. You see what's going on right now with European imperialism, right? Yeah. And the fact that the African nations are pushing hard body against it, pushing it out. See? All right. Now, the star of the movie, the head, the, the, the head character in the movie um, of Dune is called the Lisan Al-Gaib. That's an actual Arabic term that means the tongue of the unseen. And it's a reference to the Messiah. That's important, people. Trust me, it's important. Because the whole thing about monoatomic gold and the ancient philosopher's stone is inextricably tied into the mysteries of Jesus. Spice, right? The whole thing about the spice in the movie. Political control and ingestion of the spice. It demonstrates the struggle for the control of human consciousness and the link between expanded human consciousness and social destiny. This is in man. <laughs> in other words, this present world is being held together by restricting human consciousness. That's the war. The war in heaven is spoken of in the Bible is the war of narratives. It's a war in the consciousness of humanity. It has physical implications. It is extremely deadly. It is extremely dangerous because you can't kill a thought. This is powerful, people. Next slide. David Hudson. Write this guy's name down and do your research. So I'm a little bit, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. David Hudson is a cotton farmer in Arizona. David Hudson, you know, it's Arizona. Farm in Arizona, yeah, right. You know, it's that 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 soil is sun baked. It's it's not doing so well. So what he did is that he was experimenting with highly caustic chemicals to break down the soil in tr in an attempt to improve its productivity. So when he was spraying these chemicals on the soil to try to break it down, and it was subjected to the sun, the heat of the sun in Arizona, it was subjected to the sun. He was noticing and his workers were noticing these big, bright flashes of light coming off the ground. He's like, yeah, what's going on? So he started doing he started doing experiments and analyzing the soil. 
and 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 he kept coming up with you know they would they would you know do these high arc electrical arc firings to break the soil down to analyze its properties and they kept coming up with um aluminum tin and you know things like that and they're like but it wasn't behaving like aluminum so he's like i don't i don't get it and then he he contacted or this this other laboratory in Russia contacted him and said, listen, you're burning only at 10, 15 seconds. You got to burn longer. You got to burn up to around 300 seconds. So when he did that, when he subjected the soil to a longer firing, it would first register nothing. And then it would register aluminum and tin and some of these other metals. Then it would register nothing. Then all of a sudden it started to register gold and the platinum group elements. He discovered that his soil contained gold and platinum group elements in the high spin state in great amounts, in great abundance. And then he started studying old alchemical books. He read like over, over hundreds of books on old ancient alchemy, which we know is a science of our forefathers in the old world. And he found all types of parallels to his quote unquote discovery on his land. Then he began research and experimentation to find the medical and health implications of orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, monoatomic gold. I won't talk about those in great detail. You could research it yourself by looking up David Hudson, because if I talk about it in detail on this show, you're going to get flagged. Your, your, your page is going to get flagged. All right. So he, at one point he planned, he had plans to build a manufacturing plant for medical grade monoatomic gold. When that took place, he was approached by someone who said that they would finance it. And then he had his people look into this individual. Turns out this individual was connected to the military and the intelligence community. So when he backed away and said, nah, we're not gonna take your money, that man told him, he said, yeah, you're never going to get this thing off the ground. And sure enough, sure enough, <laughs> they thwarted all of his attempts to get such a thing off the ground. Mm -hmm. Next slide. All right. What is it? You all are familiar with the book Coming Forth by Day. In the European world, they call it the Book of the Dead. Egyptian Book of the Dead. Well, in that book and also in the, pap in the papyrus of Ani, there's a passage that speaks to the production of monoatomic gold. That passage says, I'm quoting it, it's on the slide, I am purified of all imperfections. What is it? I ascend like the golden hawk of Horus. What is it? I pass by the immortals without dying. What is it? I come before my father in heaven. What is it? You all know that the Aramaic word for what is it is manna or shamana. The very thing that the biblical text says that Moses fed the Hebrews at one point, but also in the book of Exodus, Moses told those same Hebrews, you have not kept the covenant. And so the manna is being taken from you but it will come back in the end times when mm. we will be a nation of high priests. Mm. Next slide. Okay. Come on, brother. 1902, Sir Flanders Petrie's expedition to Serabit El Kadim, the ancient Mount Horeb. I covered this before on his show, brother. He discovered an Egyptian temple. This is the mountain, mind you, this is the same mount that Moses was on in the Bible. He met the God of the burning bush or El Shaddai. He discovers an Egyptian temple dedicated to the goddess Hathor that was established during the Middle Kingdom um, from 1971 BC to 1926 BC. He finds numerous hieroglyphics references to Shamana, also called the stone or also called the bread. Stone as in philosopher's stone, right? found huge vats of what he thought was a fine white ash. This was not ash. It was later determined to be monoatomic gold. 
This powdered gold was and is the physical philosopher's stone. This particular temple was a manufacturing plant for this powdered gold. Okay, now we know this. the discovery of this plant answers the questions as to why certain ancient nations, such as ancient Abyssinia and others, were giving gold to the Egyptians and then later to King Solomon. Why were they doing it? Right? The classic accepted um, um, response or answer, explanation, was that, oh, well, they were paying tribute. No, they weren't. They were giving gold in the metal state to have it transmuted into white powder gold. Mm. That's what it was. Mm. All right. The high priest of this temple in the 18th dynasty was entitled in the Aramaic El Shaddai, or Lord of the Burning Bush, or Lord of the Mountain. Right? The, uh, the book of Jasher, one of the non-canonical books of the Bible, identifies El Shaddai as Moses' own father-in-law, Lord Jethro, the Midian sheep from the plains of Moab. And consumption of the stone or bread or the white powder gold gave the recipient conscious access to what they called, I can't pronounce the exact word, but it was a particular field or what the West now in quantum physics calls the biogenic or morphogenic field. What we call in the Morris Science Temple of America, the plane of soul. Mm -hmm the field of exotic space. And it was fed to the pharaohs for the purpose of conscious deification. Next slide. Again, like I said, this is all tied in and we're gonna show in greater detail how this is tied into the mysteries of Jesus and why the European world to rule the world for the first time in history had to co-opt the story of Jesus to do it. All right. Esau, Jacob's firstborn, I'm sorry, not Jacob's firstborn, Isaac's firstborn, entitled to the birthright, but gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. In other words, he gave up his birthright to gratify his lower self. He lost it, right? And then he was the father of a man named Igroth, and Igroth was the mother of Queen Ty. Queen Ty in Egypt was the junior wife of Amenhotep III. Amenhotep III was the father of Akhenaten. I cannot was the Moses people. Shout out to brother um to 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 um Billy Carson. Billy Carson just said that recently as well. I cannot's second wife, Miriam or Mary Kiba, was from whom the Egyptian royal line evolved into the royal house of David or the Davidic dynasty. Mm. Kiba Tasherit who was the daughter of Moses and Miriam and her husband, Rama, of the family of Judah, links the dynastic Egyptian line to the house of David. Mm. And in the Moorish American Quran questionnaire, the question is asked, where was he, talking about Jesus, born? Answer, in Bethlehem of Judah, in the house of David. Meaning what? He was part of a dynastic line, people. He wasn't some poor kid. Of a, of a poor carpenter. The word carpenter is mistranslated from the Greek tecton. Tecton doesn't mean carpenter. Tecton means architect. As mm. in, and it's from the Gnostic tradition, architect or archon. Okay. And what is an archon? An archon is a spiritual constructor or architect of virgin matter. In the Hebrew tradition, they're called the seven Elohim. Next slide. All right, in the Bible, you hear about, you know, Jesus going to war or, or basically beefing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those were two fraternal orders, religious and social political orders. Okay, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, they don't mention the third order, the one that Jesus belonged to, 
and that is the Essenes. Okay? He belonged to the Essenes, the Essenic order. That order he was a member of, and it was located in the Qumran area. Why is Qumran important? It's very important for a number of reasons relative to our topic. First and foremost, that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They were found on the grounds of the Essene commune where they lived. They were a semi-nomadic community. They were the watchers and the caretakers of and for the Davidic messianic lineage. They are and were the repository of the ancient and esoteric truths and spiritual technology of pre-Adamite era of time. That's the Afro-Atlantean era. So we all know from, from Solon and also too from um, the pre-Solon in Egypt and from Plato that ancient Egypt was considered an Atlantean colony, a survivor of the Atlantean destruction. All right. So also the Essenes were an outer order and access point to what we call the silent brotherhood. All right. And it afforded Jesus access to other outer orders in India and Egypt, etc. Are we familiar with the fact that Jesus, the historical Jesus's uncle, jo Joseph of Arimathea, was a very, very rich man who had ships, had a fleet of ships? That's a fact. So Jesus had access, people. The Davidic dynasty house merged. Now, this is very important. The Davidic dynastic house merged with a faction of the Hasmonean dynastic line via the marriage at Cana. Who got married in Cana? Does anyone know? Jesus married a member, a leading member of the Hasmonean dynastic line. She was from a city or town called Magdala. So she's called Mary the Magdalene. <laughs> mm. Mary the Magdalene. In much later years, the European Roman Catholic Church, to try to throw people off this track that we're talking about right now, called Mary Magdalene a prostitute. Mm. Okay. The, this is important. The survivors of what history calls the desposony, in other words, the offspring of Jesus, the survivors of the desposony, including Mary the Magdalene, migrated into Northwest Africa, present day Mauritania, and extended their influence into Spain giving rise to the Gnostic currents there. Waves of Egyptian migrations over millennia into Northwest Africa transmitted the ancient Afro-Atlantean spiritual technology there. Remember we said ancient Egypt was an old Afro-Atlantean colony. All right? And mm -hmm. this technology was taught in the Moorish universities such as Cordova and Seville from the um, 8th century all the way to the end of the 15th century, people. This is known world history. Our forefathers and mothers taught this science openly for nearly 800 years. The expulsion, and this is another key point, the expulsion of the Moors from Spain coincides with the beginnings of the African transatlantic slave trade. This is actual fact. This is part of hidden history. They don't want us to know how we're connected to world history. They want us to believe we were just some savages running around with bones in our noses and spears, and they just happened to snatch us up and civilize us by way of slavery. That is the current narrative. That narrative is a lie. George G.M. James in his book, Stolen Legacy, said the Moors are the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. In other words, 
That includes the science of white powder gold, its use and properties, and makeup. We inherited that. Next slide. Real quick, um, um yes, Brother sir. Sharif, because I know um you are um you you you're the um more science temple what are you the more science temple what now the i'm the national press secretary for the more science temple of america incorporated yes sir R right so in in your slide you just mentioned the beginning of the african transatlantic slave trade um i'm not i don't go too deep into the moors thing right but don't the moors deny the transatlantic slave trade no sir, don't absolutely they, no absolutely they, not. I, now, now let, let's just let, i'm glad you brought that up let's clear some things up right yeah there's a lot of cleanup that the Moorish Science Temple of America and the Moorish Movement proper has to do with a lot of things mm -hmm. that now are being passed on as Moorish history. Okay. okay? We do not deny the African transatlantic slave trade. We do not do that. Okay? We do, what we do deny is the narrative that it's given. So what ends up happening with people is just, is just a tendency of, of, of human.